There's a strange feeling of sailing into foreign destinations in the darkness that I can recall all the way back from my childhood growing up on a sailboat. It's a mixture of unease as you don't know exactly where and what you've got yourself into, but as you settle into bed safe and sound with the anchor set, unease drifts towards excitement as you await the morning sun to reveal your new surroundings. These feelings are heightened even more so as we've just spent the last 60 hours crossing the Gulf of Carpentaria, which is the large and shallow sea separating Australia's northernmost tip from the remote coastline of the Northern Territory. To give you some perspective, this remote and unfamiliar territory makes up only just 1% of Australia's population, while our home coast, the east coast of Australia, hosts 76%. And we've got all the way here, 340 nautical miles with a carrot saving us from sinking. Carrot. For those of you that are new here, we're Slim and Soap. Two uni students that, following COVID, putting all uni online, have decided to complete our degrees on the high seas while sailing a lap of Australia in our 10 meter 1980s retro sailboat, which is about the equivalent of sailing around continental Europe. Yeah, she's bigger than she looks. So welcome to the Northern Territory, where the next phase of our Australian circumnavigation begins. We have awoken on the Gove Peninsula in Arnhem Land. And there's no doubt that the first thing we saw after arriving in the dark was Rio Tinto's massive bauxite refinery and loading facility. It resembles something out of a Mad Max film, and honestly, we've never seen anything quite like it. As we mentioned, civilization is few and far between over the 450 nautical miles that separates us from Darwin. So our time here will mainly consist of rectifying the carrot situation and provisioning, but primarily catching up on- Getting the study in. Notes for me. And getting far enough ahead in our studies for yet another telecommunications black hole. And no, Starlink has yet to be installed on our boat, but you can be assured Elon Musk has received our order. However, apparently it's harder to get things delivered in the Northern Territory than it is to shoot rockets into space. Being grotty yotties, our first priority is confirming a rumor we've heard from other grotty yotties that there is a showering facility just one small tender right away. This trip will also mark our first time stepping foot onto Northern Territory soil. We are officially in the Northern Territory. Well, not yet, we will be in about 10 meters time when we touch land. I'll show you. <laughs> We've done it! NT. First things first, I think we could smell a pub from the boat. So, um, yeah, follow your nose. As you can tell, the ground is very red. And if you don't have a Land Cruiser or a Hilux, go home. This said pub with the potential of showering facilities is the Gove Boat Club, famous for watching the vibrant Northern Territory sunsets with a beer in hand. And we can confirm all the rumors are true. So they have showers for $10 a week per person. You can have access to their showers and laundry, which is actually very good considering that their hot water is exceptional. <laughs> it seriously felt so, so good. The appreciation for a hot shower is just through the roof. Especially when your method of showering is with a bucket of salt water. I think we would have paid any amount for a fresh water shower. And you can guarantee we made the most of the washing machines too. Anywho, how about that carrot, eh? So for those of you that watched our crossing of the Gulf, you may know that one of our sinks is currently being blocked from having salt water gushing in 
with a piece of carrot. So there's not a lot we need to do here, but one of them's probably replacing that carrot. Now, the old sink fitting, I couldn't fix it, but what I've figured out is we've got an old tube of Sikaflex that's all gone rotten at the top, like it's sealed off, it's not gonna work. But sometimes if you cut them open, somewhere down the bottom, there's still some bit that hasn't set yet because it's so far away from the oxygen. So I've cut it open and I've found a little bit of Sikaflex. I'm just gonna jam that in the old sink fitting and kind of make like an impromptu plug. Um, a bit more longer lasting than the carrot that'll hopefully at least get us to Darwin where I can properly fix it. I got it just in the nick of time. My little Sikaflex plug has dried and the carrot can be retired. I was like, he's probably getting pretty wilted. He might shrink and then fall in. And I didn't have to undo the hose clamp, put it that way. Oh no. So he did his job only just held on to the last minute. He looks right. He looks rancid. He looks like a little shriveled <laughs> or I contend that the Sikert sink fitting will last as long as we need. However, some of you may be wondering our thoughts behind using a carrot. Let's roll some sailing b-roll while we explain. Although yes, there is a seacock that we could have closed, this meant we'd lose our last remaining sink. And yes, we have wooden bungs of the right size tied to all of our seacocks aboard Nakama. However, our personal preference was to leave these in place in case of an emergency. So this is where the carrot came in and we have no regrets. It performed its role in perfect adequacy and there is no other fruit or vegetable I would recommend any higher as a makeshift bung. Speaking of vegetables, we need to restock the fridge. So it's brushing their teeth. Chili's gonna hold the fort down. We're going into town. We haven't been in real time, not YouTube time. We've been studying today for a week straight and haven't had a day off. So we're gonna go have a day off. I'm wearing the Cubra, so I'm driving. <laughs> Steal. We actually didn't steal it. We've actually been very lucky to meet some people that just lent us their car to go into town because we were trying to find a cab and it was like extracting teeth from a crocodile trying to get a cab into town. So they let us use their car, which is super nice. Of them. So thank you guys. <laughs> and we haven't even seen a crocodile yet. Who can believe that we're in Arnhem Land and we haven't seen a crocodile yet? But try extracting teeth from a crocodile we've never even found. It was that difficult. So, yeah, we are for nothing. Also, if we did find a cab, one that I'm not sure if we'd actually booked in, but we had a discussion with one at some point that sort of seemed like he might pick us up, but he wasn't 100% sure about it. And that was going to be like 40 bucks each way. So, it would have been a very expensive round trip to go to the grocery store. So, this is really pleasant. Apart from Woolies, there was little open in the small town of Nullumbai on a Sunday afternoon. But we know people don't come here just for this town. You've heard us mention Arnhem Land. This refers to the vast wilderness of the Northeast Northern Territory. Arnhem Land is very attractive to those looking for a completely remote and wild adventure. Filled with rich indigenous culture and art, challenging four-wheel drive tracks for those off-road enthusiasts, and of course, dodging crocs to pull in that perfect barramundi. Considering we don't have a four-wheel drive or a lot of time up our sleeves, we've opted for the water-based activity. However, it's a pretty dismal attempt at a fishing expedition in our fully inflatable four horsepower tender. So let's hope these barra fish are really local. It'd be nice if our tender was a hard bottom. Hey. Mate, we're the hard bottom. If we had a hard bottom, <laughs> we're the hard bottom. Don't even tempt us. 
<laughs> what do you reckon, Highfield? Do we need a hard bottom tender? Yeah, you reckon we'd be able to fish? <laughs> <laughs> do you reckon we'd be catching more fish if we had a hard bottom tender, Highfield? You might notice the smoke in the background and be like, ah, oh, there's a fire. But don't worry, it's a completely intentional fire. Backburning is a common practice in all of Australia as a preventative measure to reduce the severity of potential wildfires. As a lot of the Northern Territory is recognised Aboriginal land, a careful eye is cast over the bush for when it may be time to intentionally burn some of the fire fuels. For every day we've been here, backburning has occurred, and we can't help but think that land management practices with this much attention to detail could have significantly reduced the severity of devastation caused by the 2019 to 2020 fires on the east coast of Australia. Everything is so dry here and it's been drying out for, you know, two years. Over the period of black summer, 24 million hectares of land were scorched, along with perishing hundreds of people and killing or displacing three billion animals. While bushfires are an unavoidable reality in Australia, and in fact some flora even depend on them in order to germinate new seeds, there is certainly a lot to learn from traditional indigenous cultural practices in reducing damage caused by raging fires completely out of control. Don't worry babe, I'll catch us some dinner. These Northern Territory sunsets are seriously something else, hey? They are next level. I don't know what the difference is over here, but for some reason the sunsets are just like beautiful, big sun, golden, orange, everything great about a sunset. Everything you want in a sunset, they've got it, mate. Oh, babe, there's definitely fish, you're just not getting them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Over it, but <laughs> need that bigger tender, don't we? Yeah, go on, I feel. Oh, go on, I feel. Can't catch a barrier in this. I will get one, I'll get one, but don't you worry about that. We didn't get one, but after that shop, we've got plenty of tofu. As the sun lowered itself, we made our way back to Nakama only to find this. We should have left that carrot blocking our through hole. That's so eerie! We're in the market for a new anchor light, but I think someone's already flogged it. There was a nice looking block at the top of the mast, or even those mast, you could climb it. If you're in the mood for a tetanus shot, you could give it a climb. But um, those mast steps, we don't have any mast steps. <laughs> Just kidding, here she is, ready to take us across the rest of the Northern Territory coastline. So join us next week as we learn the hard way that you really don't want to mess up the tides up here or they will mess you up. What time was high tide? Yeah, so the tide's turned and it's coming against us. This is not nice. When we're not surfing on one of these waves, we're doing about 1.8 to two knots. Welcome to the Northern Territory, hey? What the? I was walking along and I found a crocs head. Before you go guys, Real Time Us just wanted to let you know that next Saturday on the 18th of March, we will be hosting our first ever in real life patrons only sundowners. This will be on the Gold Coast, so if you're in the area and interested in meeting up, then check out our Patreon page, the link is in the description below. We're really looking forward to meeting some of you as well as putting some faces to some names. So we'd love to see you there, but otherwise we'll catch you on YouTube as we tackle more of the Northern Territory coastline. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out. And if you really, really enjoyed this episode, then again, check out our Patreon page. Cheers guys, we'll see you when we're looking at you.